I'm Emily Jones, I'm an Associate Professor at the Bravatnik School of Government and we're hosting a series of conversations with experts on the COVID-19 crisis and public policy responses around the world. And today I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague Dapo Akande, who's Professor of International Public Law at the Blavatnik School of Government. Dapo, welcome. Hi Emily, thanks for having me. Great you could join us. So you've been thinking a lot about the international legal ramifications of all of this and there are a series of different issues that governments are having to weigh up. Would you mind just by starting by laying out these different dimensions? Yes, thank you. So in, in fighting the COVID-19, I mean governments are facing a range of, of legal issues. I suppose probably the biggest challenge arises in relation to human rights. So the governments are taking a range of measures which restrict rights that we would ordinarily enjoy. So if you think about it, you know, most people all around the world are sitting at home, maybe watching this video, and they're sitting at home because governments have taken measures that say we can't go out. So restricting our freedom of movement, restricting our freedom of assembly. In addition, as we start to come out of, of this crisis, one of the things that's being suggested are a range of technologies that we might use, for example, on our apps on our phones, which would track our movements, which would track who we've been in contact with. And these raise, uh, this raises questions about rights to privacy and how these, this type of surveillance, which is actually what it is, how this, might be, how this might be used. And then also on the human rights front, you also have um, measures that governments are taking in relation to freedom of expression. So governments are passing laws that are trying to stop fake news about how the virus may be cured or how it might be dealt with. Sometimes they're taking measures that are um, restricting the ability of opposition groups to, to sort of speak out against um, measures that, that these governments are taking. So we've got all these challenges relating to, to human rights. Just on that, and perhaps we can come back to it later in the conversation, but presumably in defense of governments, they're trying to protect our right to health. I mean, so there's sort of trade-offs they're trying to weigh up here. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think all I will say at, at this stage is that these are measures that implicate our human rights. That's not to say that they violate our human rights. And this is one of the things that we might sort of talk about. So human rights law actually has a range of, of sort of techniques and frameworks that tries to balance the ability of governments to deal with emergencies whilst at the same time respecting the rights of individuals. And so one of the things to do is to talk about whether or not governments are getting this balance right. But maybe we might, we might come back to, to that. Um, but there are all these questions in, in human rights law. Then there are other measures that governments are taking which have um, implications for the economic rights of, of individuals and for the economic rights of, of private actors. So for example, some governments, whether it's in the US, whether it's in the UK, are uh, invoking laws that allow them to commandeer private enterprise in making the things that are needed to fight the virus. So we see in the US the invocation of what's called the Defense Production Act. And this allows the government to require companies to make ventilators, require companies to make PPE, and to essentially divert them away from what would be their normal line of business. Now, this also raises questions under international law because essentially the, what is the private property of these companies? They can't make decisions as to how that private property is to be used. And so this might be possibly, this might possibly be uh, contrary to the rights that these uh, uh, companies have under international investment agreements to the extent that these companies are, are you know, foreign, foreign investors. And then you have a range of, of legal issues that might arise, for example, in relation to intellectual property rights. If we get to a stage where we do have a vaccine, where we do have cures, and those vaccines or those therapies have patent protection. Now imagine if, you know, obviously we would want every country around the world to have access to this vaccine because if there are pockets of the world where this disease continues to rage, then there's the risk that we will all be reinfected. But what if in these places they're not able to afford these vaccines, they're not able to afford these therapies, right? So how do we deal with the balance between the intellectual property rights of the companies who have invested a lot of money in coming up with these vaccines or cures on the one hand, and then on the other hand, 
trying to make sure that there's access um, to, to, these, to these treatments. Final thing, some countries like India, for example, have restricted the exports of, of PPEs. Mm. And this might, again, implicate obligations that they have under the World Trade Organization. Um, the obligation not to have quantitative restrictions on, on exports. So just a range of issues that you know, governments are having to, to face on the legal front. And a fascinating sort of panoply of issues and then the complex trade-offs that governments are having to weigh out. And perhaps we can come back to it, but on the intellectual property one, I reminded of all the discussions around access to antiretrovirals. So I guess there's some lessons that have come out from previous instances about discussions of access to healthcare um, and the intellectual properties of firms versus access to vital medicines. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and as I say, you know, this is a, 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 a case where actually there's a global interest in having global access, right? So because of the nature of the, um, the disease that we're talking about, we all have an interest in ensuring that everybody actually gets access to these vaccines or treatments if and when they do come along. So maybe we could now think through some of how governments can weigh out those trade-offs, because you gave us that interesting example there of human rights um, not necessarily being violated and governments needing to uphold different human rights. Um, so obviously there's some trade-offs and it sounds like human rights law is quite an interesting, provides for some of those sort of decision-making structures or ways of, gives governments some advice on the ways that they can make these decisions. Absolutely. So in relation to human rights, um, we have some rights that are absolute. For example, freedom from torture, the right to life, these are absolute rights. But actually most human rights are not of that absolute nature. Most human rights um, have limitations in them. In other words, something like freedom of speech, something like privacy, freedom of movement may be limited in order to achieve pressing social goals. The question is what's the framework by which we think about what's a legitimate restriction on those, on those rights. And there are two ways in which those rights may be restricted. So the first way in which those rights may be restricted is to think about the nature of the right itself. So something like freedom of movement. Obviously, the police can stop you from going to a particular location if, for example, they've cordoned it off. So in the COVID-19 case, governments are restricting all of us, actually, from moving. They're restricting us from uh, assembly. And this is because that is a right that may be restricted to achieve the legitimate aim of protecting public health. However, those restrictions, first of all, must be done by law. That's the first condition. Secondly, those restrictions must be necessary. Thirdly, those restrictions must be proportionate to the aim that the governments are trying to achieve. And finally, those restrictions must be non-discriminatory. Now, trying to achieve this trade-off, say, in the area of freedom of movement, is probably relatively easy to do. Is it necessary? What do we do? Well, we take account of the scientific consensus that actually we need to achieve a form of social distancing. More difficult is when we start to think about restrictions on our privacy rights. So when we start to see apps that are being developed in fact we already have them so in south korea they use it in in, in china they've been using it in, in singapore they've been using these apps and the question is how do we start to think about these um, conditions that i just set out in relation to privacy so first of all it must be necessary well this means that we must try to think of ways in which the app achieves the um the the least restrictive uh, infringement on our on our privacy rights right so we have to think about ways in which that happens we have to think about how those how the information that is being gathered is stored we have to think about how the information that is being gathered is shared with governmental authorities okay. all of those things and just to be clear on the type of data we're talking about here so this is a data presumably tracking our movements the state of our health whether or you know so these are ordinarily not bits of information we would be wanting to share but as you say well, it's extraordinary times but then how do we weigh weigh that up absolutely so it's not just you know so as you say it will track our movement it will track our state of health and most importantly actually it will track who we've been in contact with and so we've seen for example in south korea the government releasing information on, I think they number the cases there, they say, you know, case 15, 
the, you know, case 15 contacted the virus because case 15 was in contact with somebody at this particular location, which has led to tremendous speculation. You know, are these two people having an affair? What's going on here? So these are things that, you know, these are bits of our, our personal life, our private life that we wouldn't ordinarily want to be shared, uh, you know, to the whole country. Really, really complex issues there for governments to have to, to weigh up. Um, on the, so let's talk to us through the human rights. I'm quite interested in the, you've talked there about the, the restrictions on human rights, but I guess what, what are the obligations on governments to uphold our human rights in this instance? So, for example, to provide health care, to provide access to, say, water and sanitation to make sure we can wash our hands if we're living in an informal settlement. So mm. are those types of rights also in, in the mix? Absolutely, they are in the mix. So the rights that I've been talking about have been you know, civil and political rights. And essentially, these are the ones that I've been talking about so far. These are obligations on governments not to infringe our rights, not to do things that would be violations. But at the same time, governments also have an obligation actually to fulfill certain economic and social rights. The right to health, access to health care, um, you know, the right to, to, to water, for example, to be able to wash hands, as you've just, as you've just said. The difficulty, of course, with these economic and social rights is that they actually require the allocation of resources. Civil and political rights require allocation of resources too, but more so in relation to economic uh, and social rights, where governments have to take positive steps actually to ensure that people have access to, to, particular, um, to particular resources that they, that they need. And of course, this is going to be challenging for those governments or those states that don't actually have these resources in abundance. Can we just probe a little bit and we'll, then we'll move on from human rights, but was the question you said non-discriminatory, but I guess in what we're seeing is, for example, the sort of lockdown restrictions on movement, etc., hurting some parts of the population far more than others because they're so vulnerable. Um, so is that then taken into consideration? Because I'm thinking of people living in informal settlements who live hand to mouth. They, they then aren't able to go out and get enough money to buy food for the next day. Government's not necessarily stepping in with food provision. So how do we ensure that these measures that governments are putting in place are not having a disproportionate impact on vulnerable parts yeah. of the population? So I think you put your finger on, on, on the particular criterion there, which is the criterion of proportionality, right? So a government might be taking a step which it says it's necessary for us to achieve social distancing. But then at the same time, the government has to weigh up whether the measures that it is taking will have a disproportionate effect on achieving the goal that it's trying to achieve. So whether or not it would actually be causing more harm than the good that it is trying to that it is trying to achieve, and you know the, the law sets out these general parameters, but in concrete cases, these are decisions that have to be taken by governments and by government officials who really have to do this weighing up. Just one last thing in relation to human rights, maybe before we move away from human rights. So I said there were two ways of restricting the rights. The second one I haven't talked about, but it's also really important which is about governments declaring states of emergency. Mm. And this is something that's allowed for in human rights law. It's allowed for a government to declare a state of emergency and to formally derogate from its rights. So the government says, from its obligations, I'm sorry. So essentially the government says, we're not in a position to fulfill these rights. So we formally derogate. And actually quite a number of governments have done that across the world. So we see a number of states in Europe principally actually Eastern Europe, Serbia, Estonia have done it. Many countries in Latin America have done this. Um, and this is something that we is allowed for by human rights law, but where we need to maintain vigilance as to how it's actually implemented. And, and are there then measures set out or provisions in international human rights law about the conditions under which governments can then enact these type of provisions or derogate from the upholding human rights? So there are conditions that are set out, but they're actually fairly generic. So the first is that there must be a state of emergency. Now, typically, one is thinking of a sort of national security type scenario, but I think it's generally agreed that the scenario that we face now in relation to the protection of public health qualifies. The second condition is that the state must um, notify internationally that it is doing this. And then the third condition is that the measures that the state takes are strictly necessary. 
to uh, deal with the exigencies of the situation. So again, we come back to this question of, of necessity. And again, this links back to, are they following scientific advice? It's hard to say that you're doing something which is necessary if there isn't scientific advice that suggests that it is. I was thinking of poor civil servants trying to weigh this all up when the situation is moving so quickly, the science and the facts aren't necessarily there for them to make a fully informed decision. Um, it's tough times for governments to be making these judgment calls. But perhaps we should move on to the international economic side of this, because you've mentioned that, com that governments are then asking or sort of commandeering um, companies and asking them to de de deviate from their normal business practices and produce things like ventilators or PPE equipment. Um, so what, let's explore that a little bit and some of the factors that governments have got to weigh up, particularly in light of international investment law. That's right. So... Um... International investment law prohibits states or governments from expropriating private property, which simply means taking private property. Now, we might think, well, in this case, they haven't taken the private property, but actually there's a clear and consistent case law dealing with um, this, this area of law that says that expropriation includes cases where the state essentially enacts a regulation, which means that the private entity is not able to control its property in a way in which it ordinarily would be able to. So the fact that expropriation has this very broad meaning already implicates these rules because these companies have to do things that they would otherwise not be doing. They can't exercise their property rights in the same way. Now, the interesting thing is that actually most of the, the treaties that deal with this bilateral investment treaties and multilateral treaties that deal with, with investments like free trade agreements, most of them actually do not have a specific exemption or a rather specific exception that allows states to take these kinds of measures for, for public health reasons or for other pressing social needs. And so what will be required actually is to read in to these treaties something that suggests that states have a sort of general regulatory power, what's, what's uh, known by lawyers as a general police power, actually mm -hmm. to take measures in the public interest. So well, just to be clear, and we can come to the dispute side of this um, later, but does that mean that then governments have got to be incredibly careful when they're sort of thinking about which companies to commandeer and if they're commandeering or asking foreign companies to change their business practices, then they could be held. What, 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 would, what, what might be at stake? What might happen? What kind of dispute? Well, what, might, what might be at stake is that uh, states might be sued under these uh, bilateral investment treaties and, and other treaties and governments might be required to pay compensation in the end for having, you know, essentially commandeered the resources of, of these companies. Unless, of course, we can reach, or unless, of course, the tribunals that deal with this read in this sort of general exception that I've just been, been talking about. I'm just immediately thinking then you've got a bit of a disparity between the rights of domestic companies who might be commandeered and have no recourse to then compensation or these international courts and then the foreign companies. Absolutely. Absolutely. So and this has been one of the, the difficult issues in relation to this area of international law. The fact that you know, foreign companies, foreign investors have special access to particular remedies and also to particular substantive uh, protections, which domestic, uh, domestic companies don't have. And just perhaps before we move on to the question of sort of what disputes might arise out of this, I wanted to just probe a little bit more this question of intellectual property and access to vaccines. So, of course, sitting at Oxford University with one of the front runner vaccines be being developed, other teams are working across the world to try and get these vaccines out. And of course, with big international pharmaceutical companies going to have to play a major role in that. Mm. And as you said, in the past, we've sort of seen people criticise the, the mechanisms for these kind of rollout of essential medicines and not getting the balance right between sort of public health needs and then the need to incentivize and reward the companies that are putting in the R&D effort. So can you just talk us through a little bit with COVID exactly what's going on and what the concerns are around this? Yeah, so the concern is that, you know, as with all sort of medical treatment, all vaccines that, you know, companies will acquire patent prote uh, protection for, for the vaccines or the treatments that they develop. And if they acquire patent protection for them, then this then means that, you know, they will be able to, they will have exclusive rights to sell these, uh, these treatments. Obviously, everybody around the world will want to buy these treatments. Uh, 
And the question then is, what about those countries that don't have the resources to be able to buy them at, at market price? So if they're not able to buy them at market price, can we, deal, can we find sorry, some kind of mechanism that allows these uh, states to actually still get, get access? I mean, one hopes that um, these companies will do the right thing, and one hopes that also that there will be a, a lot of pressure also from developed countries who are themselves actually putting in a lot of money into developing these, uh, these vaccines and these, these treatments. But nonetheless, questions might still arise as to, you know, what about the possibility that states might actually compulsorily license these, uh, these patents? In other words, that they might forcibly require companies actually to produce these vaccines within those particular countries um, in a manner which would otherwise, without the license, be inconsistent with those patent rights. And then sort of companies in India, I think in generics companies or in the global south, then being able to produce those vaccines that otherwise they wouldn't able to. Exactly, absolutely, exactly. So let's turn to now sort of looking forward, and you've mentioned all of these international, how in, international law is sort of implicated in a lot of what's going on and the legal obligations that states have under international law. Presumably we might well be looking at a whole monopoly of cases, international legal cases and disputes brought about from human rights to international economic law, perhaps even over the compulsory licensing. Um, what, where, what's the outlook? What do you think we, we're looking at? So I think we will see a lot of cases arising out of, of COVID-19. I mean, the analogy that I tend to think about is the Argentinian financial crisis, right? So not on a similar scale, but um, a, a, you know, really a national crisis where the government of Argentina had to take a whole range of measures to try to fight that. And as Argentina came out of that crisis or started to come out of that crisis, it was faced with a barrage of, of arbitration claims against it under international investment agreements. And I think we probably will start to see some of those as we come out of this crisis with companies bringing actions against states before arbitral tribunals and then seeking to enforce whatever you know judgments or awards they get all around all around the world i think we'll also see um human rights cases before regional and international human rights courts and in particular i suspect that we will see cases in the european court of human rights in relation to the range of, of measures that states have, have taken um, we'll probably see some challenges in relation to, in relation to the right to privacy that I was t uh, talking about, particularly in relation to the apps uh, as those start to get um, developed. We see, for example, in Hungary, just to give a, a, a particular case, you know, the, the Hungarian government declared a state of, of emergency. The Hungarian legislature has essentially, you know, ceded, the parliament has essentially ceded its powers to the government, allowed the government to take measures without parliamentary approval. Um, and there are allegations that some of these measures are being taken in a manner which is essentially just designed to be oppressive of the, the opposition. So I suspect that we will see a number of cases at the European Court of Human Rights dealing with, dealing with all of this. And how well equipped are sort of international legal courts to actually ensure we've got a fair outcome and just making sure that I'm thinking big companies are well placed to then bring a, um, a lodge a dispute, bring a case forward, but I'm thinking small vulnerable communities who've had their human rights violated, their ability to get recourse from the international system presumably is nowhere near as strong. So just sort of the eff efficacy, if you like, of the system as, as it is now to uphold and make the wise judgments that we are gonna need to be made. Yeah. So in terms of access to, to these um, international legal uh, bodies, you know, one, this is one of the areas where civil society plays a significant role. And I think on the human rights side, we, we have seen already and we will see a number of uh, civil society organizations actually being very vigilant here and taking cases on behalf of vulnerable communities that you that you mentioned so i think actually that there will act there, there will be the possibility and a significant possibility of access to these international judicial bodies the difficulty i think is going to be around a point that you made earlier which is how do these courts and tribunals actually try to make how do they try to pass judgment on judgments that states are making 
in difficult circumstances. So I said, these measures have to be necessary. You have to follow the science, but there isn't necessarily scientific consensus. And it's quite likely, I think, that judgments will give what sometimes described as a margin of appreciation. This is the, the expression that's used by the European court, a margin of appreciation to governments. In other words, they will allow government some leeway actually making these decisions and being cognizant of the fact that governments have to, you know, they're the ones who have the, the sort of political authority to make these sorts of judgments in cases where they're not clear cut. Thanks, Dapo. And just thinking to conclude our conversation today um, about the lessons we should take from this. So there's sort of one or two lessons that you'd highlight that come out of from a sort of international legal perspective on the current crisis. Sure. I, I think if there's one word that I would um, use to, to set out the key lesson, it would be vigilance. You know, that we need to be vigilant in relation to the protection of, of our rights. And what I mean by that is that if you think about the legal rules that I've been describing, actually they don't work in isolation, particularly the human rights rules, the rules that are there to try to ensure that there's a, a, a fair balance between the rights of individuals and fighting an emergency. What these rules actually do is they try to structure politics. So if you take the rules relating to um, states of emergency, the requirement that it be declared is to try to ensure that there is discussion within the country about whether the conditions are right. The requirement that they be internationally notified is to try to ensure that there be an international sort of discussion of whether or not there is a, a state of, of, of emergency. The requirement that restrictions are adopted by law is there to ensure that actually at the national level, there is some kind of oversight. So these rules are all intended to ensure that there is a degree of vigilance. The other thing that I would say in terms of vigilance is that when it comes to rights, is that I think we must push for these rules that are being adopted to have sunset clauses. So not only do we need to have the discussion now about the measures, but a sunset clause ensures that we have the discussion later on, that these measures will be terminated unless they are renewed. So making really a clear exit strategy, if you like, from this is a suspension of human rights obligations, etc. Exactly. Dapo, thank you so much. It's been a real masterclass there in international public law as it applies to COVID-19. Much appreciated. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Emily.